Okay, now we can get started. So, um, I spent three lectures talking about citric acid cycle, glyoxylate cycle, and metabolic control. And I think that should give you some perspective, shh, some perspective on the relative importance I uh, assigned to those. So I think that's a, those are fairly important topics. We'll talk more about metabolic control over the next uh, week or two, um, and um, you'll see more about that. Today, however, is a sort of a side uh, change, or a, a, a directional change, in that um, it's mostly going to be things relating to structure, okay? So um, I want to spend the lecture talking about lipids and lipid structures. Um, and some function, but mostly structure. So today's lecture will have nothing to do with metabolism, but it's important that I introduce the topic of lipids because they're essential components for membranes. And as we will discover, membranes are essential uh, for our understanding of metabolic control. So you got a taste of metabolic control when I talked about the um, Cori cycle and sugar metabolism. And you'll get an even bigger taste of that when we talk about um, electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation uh, next week. So, but as I said, today I'm going to talk mostly about structural things, and I think students find this is pretty straightforward stuff. You've learned a lot of this in organic chemistry already, and my purpose in going through it uh, isn't so much to review as much as it is just to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of understanding all of these different types of molecules. Well, uh, lipids are relevant for us because lipids, of course, directly relate to obesity. Um, and obesity is a uh, uh, very important health concern in this country. Uh, Americans are uh, entirely too heavy, uh, many obese, and way too many morbidly obese, which uh, uh, both of which have very important health consequences. These two mice that you can see here, uh, one on the left is a mutant mouse that is deficient uh, in a gene called leptin that's important in fat metabolism and in um, uh, things relating to appetite. And as a consequence, uh, will eat itself to death, as you see here that it's already uh, on its way to doing. We also have that hormone, and we have a few people uh, who have leptin deficiencies or leptin receptor problems, and they too have problems like this mouse, but we can't assign very many uh, obesity problems directly to leptin. So it's not a simple answer, and not a simple, <coughs> excuse me, a simple problem for uh, us to discuss in human beings. So uh, as you can imagine, understanding uh, the roots of obesity, means of controlling obesity, and so forth, is a very active area of research. Okay, well, uh, talking about lipids, we need to uh, start talking about the most fundamental lipids that we talk about here, and these are the fatty acids. Fatty acids, of course, are molecules that um, are, at one end, hydrophobic. Uh, that is, they just have carbons and hydrogens. And at the other end, and they, that would be the end down here on the right, would be hydrophobic. And on the other end, they are hydrophilic in having a carboxyl group. Okay? So this brings to mind something that we see commonly in every lipid, and that is that every single lipid <coughs> excuse me, has at least one part of it that's very nonpolar. It may have a polar part, and we're going to see some polar parts today among the lipids. But um, all lipids will have at least one part that's fairly nonpolar. So fatty acids, as I said, are simple examples of that. When we look at the fatty acids, fatty acids, of course, are constituents of fat. And I will show you that structure uh, in just a little bit. But fatty acids uh, come in two forms, uh, forms known as saturated versus unsaturated. And in organic chemistry, you learn that saturated molecules have only single bonds, whereas unsaturated molecules have at least one double bond. Unsaturated fatty acids, um, and I'll go through some names uh, for you in just a minute. Uh, unsaturated fatty acids um, uh, are included in a group of fatty acids that we call essential fatty acids. Now, not all unsaturated fatty acids are essential. 
but some are. And an essential fatty acid is a fatty acid that you have to have in your diet. It means that you can't make it. So if you're unable to make it, you have to have it in your diet. Otherwise, there are major problems that you will have as a consequence of that. We use that designation of essential and non-essential also for amino acids and for the same purpose. There are some amino acids that our bodies can't make. We have to have them in our diet. Those are called essential uh, amino acids. And those that our body can make, we don't have to have in our diet. They're non-essential. We can make many fatty acids. Those, of course, are the non-essential fatty acids. And we can make essentially all of the um, saturated fatty acids. So we don't see saturated fatty acids being among the essential fatty acids, only some of the unsaturated. Well, as you look at this, uh, these structures, as you can see here, I hope you remember from your organic chemistry, that single bonds have complete freedom and ability to rotate around them. So uh, though we draw that as a straight chain, all these bonds can be rotated in any way that um, would be convenient for the molecule, depending upon the environment that it's in. On the other hand, a double bond, such as we see in this oleic acid that's up here, imposes a kink. Double bonds can't be rotated. And uh, that kink will go one of two ways. If it goes the way that you see it on the screen, that involves a cis bond, and a cis bond will put a distinctive kink in there. We see um, among the vast majority of fatty acids that are found in uh, living organisms, the vast majority of these fatty acids are all in the cis configuration. There's only very rare ones that are found in the trans configuration. Okay? So that's important to remember when we talk about trans fats, for example. These are fats that contain fatty acids that have trans double bonds. And trans double bonds don't get there, for the most part, biologically. They get there by chemical alteration of food. Okay? Chemical alteration of food. And I'll say a little bit about that when I talk about the fats. Okay? So that's how we get trans fats or trans fatty acids uh, in uh, our food. Okay. Well, the cis, as I said, is the normal configuration for uh, fatty acids. Uh, that are found in the vast majority of cells. When we look at fatty acids, we have a list here of fatty acids that I can be really mean and say, we'll memorize everything that's up here. And I wouldn't think that would have a very major um, importance, to be honest. There are some fatty acids, however, I think you should know their general structure, right? So among the saturated fatty acids, these are the ones that you see on the screen, you should certainly know that palmitic acid, which is the most abundant fatty acid that we have, is, uh, has 16 carbons. You should also know that stearic acid is also a saturated fatty acid with 18 carbons. And finally, you should know arachidic acid. And notice where I'm going to say another word in a little bit, arachidonic, that sounds like that, but it's not the same. Arachidic acid has 20 carbons. So all three of these fatty acids that I just described to you are uh, saturated fatty acids, and they are all very commonly found inside of our cells. You'll also notice when you look at this uh, thing on the screen that the size of these fatty acids differ by two, okay? Palmitic has 16, stearic has 18, arachidic has 20. And the reason that they differ by two is that, as we will see uh, next week, or the week after, the synthesis pathway for making fatty acids involves the addition of two carbons at a time. And that addition of two carbons at a time results in what you see on the screen. Are there fatty acids with odd numbers of carbons? The answer is yes, there are. And these arise oftentimes by other processes than standard fatty acid synthesis. So just like we saw very few trans fatty acids uh, biologically, so too do we see relatively few uh, fatty acids with odd numbers of carbons. Okay? So that's the fatty acid story. Um, the most common fatty acid, as they say in our body, is palmitic acid, and we'll see why 
when I talk about the synthesis of fatty acids uh, upcoming soon. Okay. The unsaturated fatty acids, I've got a similar table, and it's a little bit more complicated because they can have double bonds. Now, unsaturated fatty acids are known as either monounsaturated, in which case they only have one double bond, or polyunsaturated, meaning they have more than one double bond. Well, the location of those double bonds uh, is critical. And I'm going to show you a numbering scheme in a second uh, where you can learn something about the location of those bonds. For the most part, I want you to just know this in general. I think that you should know, for example, uh, oleic acid, which is right here, uh, is a fatty acid that has 18 carbons, and it has one double bond. Okay? And that one double bond is located at what we call position delta 9, and I'll show you that numbering scheme in just a second. Now that turns out to be a pretty important fatty acid. It is a fatty acid that we can make. We can make oleic acid, but we cannot make some of the other fatty acids that are shown on this table. Two other, actually three other fatty acids that I think that you should know on this table include linoleic, which is shown right here. It also has 18 carbons. And instead of having one double bond, it has two double bonds. Now you'll see that oleic had double bond that was labeled as delta 9. That means according to one of the numbering schemes I'm going to show you that the ninth carbon is the location for that double bond. You can also see that uh, linoleic has a double bond at delta 9 and also at delta 12. It turns out that animals cannot synthesize fatty acids beyond position delta 9. So delta 12 is beyond delta 9, and we can't synthesize that fatty acid, meaning that linoleic acid is, a, uh, is an essential fatty acid. Similarly, uh, linolenic acid is another one that you should know, and linolenic acid is also 18 carbons, and now it has three double bonds, and you can see there at delta 9, 12, 15, and you might suspect that it also would be non, uh, I'm sorry, that it would be an essential fatty acid, and you would be correct. It is an essential fatty acid. The last of the fatty acids here that I think you should know something general about would be arachidonic acid. So arachidonic acid, as its name suggests, is related to arachidic acid. The difference being that arachidic acid had 20 carbons and no double bonds. Arachidonic acid has 20 carbons and four double bonds. Now arachidonic acid, we will talk about later today, is important uh, for the synthesis of a class of molecules known as the prostaglandins. And it's also important for the synthesis of some of the cannabinoids. These are the, some of the active ingredients in marijuana. Okay? So, Four amino acids that you should know here, oleic, linoleic, linolenic, and arachidonic. And yes, as you might guess, arachidonic is, in fact, an essential fatty acid. Okay? So all these fatty acids are very important for us. Okay. Um, I promised you numbering, and so here's the numbering that we use. There are actually two different numbering <laughs> schemes. And the numbering schemes differ from what they call carbon number one. One numbering scheme, known as the delta scheme, starts carbon number one at the carboxyl. The other numbering scheme, known as the omega, starts carbon number one at the methyl at the other end. So whenever we use a numbering, we have to designate, are we talking about delta or are we talking about omega? Okay. Well, omega is probably a term that you've heard of before. Some of you have heard of omega-3 fatty acids. You may have heard of omega-6 fatty acids. Well, what does that mean? Well, an omega-3 fatty acid would mean it has a double bond located at omega-3. Where's omega-3 here? Well, there's omega-1, 2, 3. This guy right here is an omega-3 fatty acid. The omega designation is usually given to number, to, to, I'm sorry, to describe the first double bond. So the first double bond being at position three would make that omega three. 
If the first double bond were found at position 6, we would call it omega 6. All right? But we wouldn't call this one omega 6 because the first double bond is actually found at position 3. If we were to look at that starting at the other end in terms of numbering, then we would say this is a delta 12963 or 36912. I don't care what order you put them into. It doesn't really matter. But again, so long as you designate delta versus omega. And one is not 18 minus the other one, by the way, because remember that not all fatty acids have 18 carbons in them, so the systems uh, vary uh, according to uh, the length of the fatty acid. OK, questions about that? Everybody's excited by that. All right, let's move on uh, and talk about fats and oils. So fatty acids, of course, are important constituents of fats and oils. Before I talk about the structure of fats and oils, let's um, give a, uh, let me give you a little uh, background. Fats and oils have the same basic chemical structure. They differ, however, in that fats um, are molecules that are uh, essentially solids at room temperature, whereas oils are molecules that are liquid at room temperature. Okay? Well, why are some solids and some are liquids at room temperature? It really relates to a couple of things. One is the length of the fatty acids in the fat. The longer it is, the higher the melting temperature. The shorter it is, the lower the melting temperature. And the other has to do with the amount of unsaturation. It's the amount of unsaturation that's actually a much bigger factor. The more unsaturation there is, that is the more fatty acids that have double bonds and the more of those double bonds themselves that there are in a molecule, the lower the melting temperature will be. Well, if you have enough fatty acids that have lowered melting temperatures, then it can be liquid at room temperature because its melting temperature is below that of room temperature. On the other hand, if you have a mostly saturated fat with very few double bonds in there, then it's going to have a higher melting temperature and it's going to remain solid at room temperature. Well, um, that's the background of fats and oils. As we look at this molecule, we can see some basics of structure. So structure, I'm not going to ask you to memorize structures here. The things I talked about, how many carbons and so forth is really, and where the double bonds are, really the things that I want you to understand. But you should understand something about the general structure of a fat. And I'm going to tell you what that is. So a fat is a molecule that is what we refer to as a triacylglycerol. An acyl group is essentially a fatty acid. Okay? For our purposes, it's essentially a fatty acid. So a triacylglycerol, uh, the name tells us what the structure is. Triacyl, meaning it has three fatty acids in it. It's a glycerol, meaning it has glycerol in it. And those three fatty acids are joined to the glycerol through ester linkages. And that's what you can see up here. In each case, that's an ester bond that joins the fatty acid to the glycerol molecule. Well, what you do when you make a fat by making a, a structure like what you see here is you convert a fatty acid that is amphiphilic okay, into a fat which is hydrophilic. Okay? I trust you remember those names from last term. Hydro, I'm sorry, hydrophobic. A hydrophobic molecule is a molecule that avoids water. I said hydrophilic. I didn't mean hydrophilic. I meant hydrophobic. Fat is hydrophobic. Hydrophobic molecules don't dissolve well in water. By contrast, hydrophilic molecules, which is what fatty, or, I'm sorry, what some molecules are like, uh, ions and so forth, are very soluble in water. And amphiphilic molecules like fatty acids have both characteristics, part hydrophobic, part hydrophilic. Well, we've converted a fatty acid that was uh, amphiphilic into a fat which is hydrophobic. Now, that has some pretty big consequences for us. First of all, it means that in our body, fats have to be specifically sequestered in specific places. We have specialized cells that hold fat. 
We might say, oh, wow, I got a lot of fat, et cetera. However, um, I don't have fat just distributed at places where there's fat. Fat is contained within cells, and those cells that hold fat are specialized, and they're known as adipocytes, A-D-I-P-O-C-Y-T-E-S, adipocytes. So adipocytes are sometimes called fat cells. There are different kinds of adipocytes, okay? One kind of adipocyte that people are very interested in understanding are those known as brown fat. And I won't talk about that here. I will say something about those later in the term. Uh, brown fat uh, has different, pro the cells known as brown fat have different properties uh, than other adipocytes. And um, they are thought to be more of, I don't want to say healthy, but they're more associated with healthy uh, types of fat storage. Okay. Uh, you notice that this particular fat has some fatty acids that are saturated, some fatty acids that are unsaturated. The most common type of fat that we see has a saturated fat, fatty acid, I'm sorry, at the first carbon, the top carbon that's up there. And it typically has an unsaturated fatty acid at carbon number two. Carbon number three doesn't have so much of a pattern. And you can imagine that if we have a, a fat that has um, a fatty acid at position number three, like this guy does, that has a lot of unsaturated bonds in it, that this guy would be very likely to be an oil. Whereas if that third position contained a fatty acid that was mostly saturated, we might think it would be more likely to be uh, a fat. Okay? And those are just general tendencies. Now fats, as we will see, are related to another class of molecules that are very important for membranes. Fats, a very common mistake students make on my exam is they try to tell me that fats are part of membranes. They're not. Okay? Fats are stored in adipocytes. They're not part of membranes. And the reason that they're not part of membranes is because membrane uh, components generally have an amphiphilic nature. Fat does not have an amphiphilic nature. It's mostly nonpolar. Okay? So it's stored in a specific cell in a specific way so that the, the cell can deal with that. Another consequence I meant to mention, I forgot to mention, but I'll, I'll say it here, about the insolubility of fats in water is that fats are stored in specific cells, but that energy from fats is needed all over the body. So how do fats and fatty acids get from the location that they're in to other locations in the body? If, they, uh, if they're not soluble in water, because the bloodstream is an aqueous environment. Well, that actually poses a bit of a problem for the body, in that the body has to package up fat and fatty acids into little complexes so that they can travel in the bloodstream. Now, what that means is that you can't get rapid energy from fat. It's one of the reasons your body uses glucose for rapid energy. The liver can just dump glucose into the bloodstream. It's soluble in the aqueous environment. It travels to target tissues and can give almost instantaneous uh, energy. Fats have to be packaged up. They have to get to a receptor. They have to be internalized. They have to be digested. There's a lot of things that have to happen to a fat in order for a cell to get that energy. And believe me, if there were faster ways of getting fat energy out of fat, I would be very much in favor of them. Um, but we don't have that. OK. Well, I mentioned digesting of a fat. So how is it that cells digest fats? Cells digest fats using enzymes known as lipases. Lipases are very important uh, for that process. Okay. And all they do is they use water to hydrolyze a, an ester bond. They typically start at position one, as you can see up here, and uh, hydrolyze a single fatty acid off. They hydrolyze the fatty acids off one at a time. And there are specialized lipases, some that work on triacylglycerols, some that work on diacylglycerols. You can see there's only two acyl groups on this guy in the middle. And some that work on monoacylglycerols. Uh, 
Well, it turns out that the naming of these uh, is very trivial. You can know the names of these very easily by virtue of the fact that a triisoglycerol lipase cleaves triisoglycerols, a diisoglycerol lipase cleaves diisoglycerols, and a monoisoglycerol lipase cleaves monoisoglycerols. Interestingly, the only one of these enzymes that's regulated by the body is the triisoglycerol lipase the only one that's regulated by the body. But it means that these other, and that says tri, doesn't it? That should say diisoglycerol lipase. Well, actually, I take it back. I take it back. Triisoglycerol lipase can also work on dyes. So if you want to call this diisoglycerol lipase, you can. Uh, but triisoglycerol lipase will also work on the dyes. I, I forgot that. Uh, yeah, question. So the lipase is separate. I'm sorry? You can, and you can call it two different things, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do want you to, to call this guy up here triisoglycerol lipase, definitely, okay? All right, but if you want to call this guy diisoglycerol lipase, because it's easier to remember, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, now, um, interestingly, as I said, this is the only enzyme that is hormonally regulated, and that means that these other reactions can't occur unless this first reaction actually occurs. That means, then, that the hormonal regulation of this is critical. Now, last term, I hope you talked a little bit about um, uh, G protein coupled receptors, uh, adrenergic receptor, and so forth. I see some yeses. Is that right? OK. Well, the um, adrenergic receptor that you talked about relative to um, the G proteins in glycogen metabolism and in glucose metabolism is the same receptor that's involved in controlling this guy. You may remember from last term that the uh, activation of that receptor caused phosphorylation of a variety of proteins that then made them either active and inactive, depending upon whether they were breaking down glycogen or they were synthesizing glycogen, right? If you phosphorylate proteins breaking down glycogen, they become activated. And if you phosphorylate proteins involved in synthesizing glycogen, they become inactive. Well, if you phosphorylate triisoglycerol lipase, you activate it. Okay? This is activated by the same G protein system that we saw before. And it means that, again, there's a consistent response that cells are giving to a stimulus. When this phosphorylation cascade gets started, the cell is saying, I, or the body is saying, I need energy. That's what adrenaline is doing. I need energy. So what does the body do? The body dumps glucose into the bloodstream because the body is saying, I need energy. The body starts breaking down fats into fatty acids because the body is saying, I need energy. So this response is consistent, and it's very simple. Okay. So one response, a lot of effects happening as a result of that action. OK, questions on that? Question. Yeah, question. Yeah, that's a good question. Are the proteins needed to activate these proteins only found in specialized fat cells? Triisoglycerol lipase uh, would be only found in fat cells, yes, okay? But triisoglycerol lipase is not a receptor. So the receptor that you have for the epinephrine hormone would be found in a wide variety of cells. But if there's no triisoglycerol lipase to activate, then it would, it would have no effect on that. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Well, let's uh, turn to a related class of molecules to the fats. These are molecules that we categorize as the phosphatides or the phosphatidyl compounds. Okay? If you look at them, you'll see that, first of all, they are um, comprised of glycerol, just like the triisoglycerols. But in fact, they are diisoglycerols. And by the way, if I'm drawn on the left versus the right, there's no difference as far as we're concerned here. In fact, this guy here actually has it on the left in terms of the overall uh, geometry, but we get lazy and write it on the right many times like I did in the last one. I'm not going to worry about the stereospecificity. But I want you to recognize that left versus right for our purposes is the same thing. So this is a diisoglycerol, but instead of having a fatty acid on position number three, 
you see there's a phosphate there. So this phosphate causes this group of molecules, or is the, the, per, the parental structure of this group of molecules, known as the phosphatides. So when you hear about phosphatidyl compounds, or you hear about phosphatides, I want you to think diacylglycerol, that's all this stuff up here, linked to a phosphate at position number three. Now the addition of this phosphate has very important implications chemically. Very important implications chemically. Because what it does is it converts that hydrophobic fat molecule into an amphiphilic glycerophospholipid. All right? Phosphatides are what we call glycerophospholipids. Again, the name tells you what it is. Glycero, it has a glycerol backbone. Phospho, meaning it has a phosphate. Lipid, meaning it contains lipid, and these guys here are lipids. Okay? All right. Uh, you also hear these sometimes called phosphoglycerides. Same thing. Same thing. Phosphoglycerides equals glycerophospholipids. I prefer glycerophospholipids because, again, the name tells you the structure. If you listen to the names, you'll understand the structures. Now, why do we have molecules like this? We have molecules like this because they are building blocks and essential components of membranes. Membranes need to have, usually, amphiphilic compounds. And this is an amphiphilic compound. Now, what's all this business here? Well, it turns out that that phosphate that's on the um, glycerophospholipid at position number three is usually attached to something else. So if we take that phosphate and we attach it to a molecule of choline, we create a molecule called phosphatidylcholine. If I take, uh, instead of choline, I attach an ethanolamine to that, phosph that phosphate at the end of the glycerophospholipid, I create phosphatidyl ethanolamine. You can figure out what the other two will do, right? Now, these guys all are fairly polar, meaning that they're consistent with that portion of the molecule being polar and being amphiphilic. And these are found in varying distributions in membranes, and it varies somewhat with the tissue in terms of which molecule is attached to the phosphate at the end. We're not going to spend any time talking about that. But suffice it to say that these all keep that molecule being amphiphilic. Here's phosphatidylcholine, all right? Now in this case, I've, I've, um, uh, I've drawn it. So here's the glycerol in black. Here's the two fatty acids sticking off of it in green and blue. And here's the phosphate in red. And then here's the choline attached to it. And again, I'm not showing you this to memorize how to draw the entire bloody thing. But if I said to you, you know, what's the general structure of phosphatidylcholine, I would hope you'd be able to say, well, there's a glycerol, two fatty acids, a phosphate, and a choline. Because that's what a phosphatidylcholine is. If you know what a phosphatidyl group is, then I can say, what's a phosphatidyl Kevin Ahern? And you can say, it's got a glycerol, it's got two fatty acids, it's got a phosphate, and it's got an ugly guy stuck on the end of it, right? Okay. You guys are slow today. Okay. Um, phosphatidylinositol is an interesting uh, compound that we find in membranes. And it's interesting because this molecule is actually involved in the process uh, of signaling. You learned a little bit about signaling last term. And phosphatidylcholine is, a, is a, when it gets cleaved at this position as shown right here, that phosphatidylcholine results in uh, the production of two molecules, one of which stays embedded in the membrane, and the other of which goes into the cytoplasm, and both of those molecules initiate a signaling process. Okay? So phosphatidylinositol is an important uh, phosphatidyl compound found in the signaling process. Cardiolipin is one of the more unusual um, glycerophospholipids. 
Um, and this, to draw it, we actually have to take a, a few liberties compared to what I've shown you before. So before I've been showing you the glycerol, the glycerol backbone on the left side and then things hanging off of it. However, with cardiolipin, we have the glycerol um, uh, backbone uh, shown here, but we also have a second glycerol uh, backbone shown over here. So there's two glycerol backbones in cardiolipin. Each of them has two fatty acids sticking off of it, as you see here. And in the middle, there's actually a third glycerol. So there are three glycerol molecules found in cardiolipin. Two of them contain fatty acids. The one in the middle doesn't contain fatty acids. It just bridges the phosphates uh, there. So you can see schematically down here what that looks like. It's a diphosphatide with a glycerol bridging the two. Now, I tell you this one because cardiolipin uh, was originally found in heart. and It was considered to be uh, something that was unique to heart. We know it's not unique to heart. But the reason it was found in heart was because heart is very rich in mitochondria. And it turns out that this compound is very um, uh, abundant in the mitochondrial inner membrane that we'll talk about later. It's very abundant in the mitochondrial inner membrane. And that mitochondrial inner membrane is essential for the function of uh, the mitochondria and also for the function of the cell. If the inner mitochondrial membrane in some way gets damaged, cardiolipin actually plays a role in telling the cell that we've got damage, we've got problems in the mitochondrion, and this cell should therefore kill itself. Okay? So cardiolipin plays a very important role in that process. Cardiolipin turns out to be fairly readily oxidized. One of the things that you find with mitochondria is that mitochondria, because they work a lot with oxygen, generate what are called reactive oxygen species, ROS. And reactive oxygen species, as their name would suggest, react very readily. They react in the absence of enzymes. And remember I said earlier that cells don't like things where enzyme isn't controlling the process, right? I talked about that with ketone bodies, how acetoacetate would spontaneously go to acetone. That wasn't an enzymatic process, that was a chemical process. Well, reactive oxygen species will also react in the absence of any enzymatic action. They're not easily controlled. Since the mitochondrial has a lot of oxygen, it has a fair amount of reactive oxygen species, and mitochondria, as a consequence, get readily damaged. This cardiolipin is playing a role in monitoring is the mitochondrion okay, in which case the cell can go on, or is the mitochondrial the mitochondrion damaged, in which case the cell may need to commit suicide. Okay, um, a related compound I'll just parenthetically uh, mention is a molecule, a class of molecules known as plasmalogens. And plasmalogens differ from glycerol phospholipids in one important category, and that is they have an ether linkage at carbon number one instead of an ester linkage. And that turns out to give some protection to those molecules against damage by reactive oxygen species. And consequently, we find them in places like the heart, the brain, and nerve tissue. Okay? So plasmalogens are important protective molecules. They're related to the glycerol phospholipids, but differ in having an ether bond instead of an ester bond. All right, the sphingolipids. The sphingolipids are molecules I like to think of as similar to the glycerol phospholipids, but also very distinct from them. Okay? The starting place for making sphingolipids are two common cellular molecules. Sphingolipids are made typically starting with palmitic acid, which is one of the fatty acids that I've talked about, and the amino acid serine. So you put a fatty acid, a palmitic acid together with serine, you make one of the starting compounds for making a sphingolipid. And because you have serine, 
that tells you that this class of molecules has something that's fundamentally different than the glycerol phospholipids. Who knows what it is? It's an atom. Nitrogen, okay? So we see nitrogen in sphingolipids. We don't see nitrogen in glycerol phospholipids. Unless we add something like a serine, you know, like a phosphatidyl serine or something. But if we just had a glycerol phospholipid, we would have no nitrogen in there. Sphingolipids always have nitrogen in them. Always have nitrogen. Now, a sphingolipid, you know, is, is quite different in some ways from the glycerol phospholipids, but in other ways, we can arrange it so that the backbone looks kind of like a glycerol. That's not a glycerol, but we can think of carbon, nitrogen, carbon is the backbone there, and it would resemble in some way a glycerol phospholipid. You're not going to draw this structure, don't worry, okay? You're not going to draw this structure. But like glycerol phospholipids, sphingolipids will have a fairly polar end. We'll see some of those attachment molecules in a minute. And it will have nonpolar tails. Look at these two tails hanging off, just like the fatty acids that we saw in a glycerol phospholipid. So chemically, it's not overly different from a glycerol phospholipid. Okay? And if we look at uh, the uh, projection of a sphingolipid, uh, in this case, a molecule called sphingomyelin with a phosphoglyceride or a glycerophospholipid, we see that in three-dimensional space, they're not drastically different from each other. Now, there are important differences besides that nitrogen that I talked about. And one of these is that sphingolipids usually, not always, but usually do not contain phosphate. Instead, they usually contain a sugar as their polar compound. So glycerol phospholipids have that phosphate as their polar compound. Sphingolipids tend to have a sugar or a complex set of sugars as their polar compound. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, of that. Now sphingomyelin is um, an unusual example of a sphingolipid that actually does have a phosphate. Sphingomyelin does contain a phosphate. Most sphingolipids do not. Sphingomyelin is a molecule, as its name would suggest, that's an important component of the myelin sheath of nerve cells. Very important component of the myelin sheath of nerve cells. Okay? Okay. Now, there's a, another schematic representation of the same thing. In this case, I've drawn this polar part hanging down. In this case, I've got a single myelin, and you can see there's a phosphate there. But if I had some other sphingolipid, instead of having a phosphate at that point, I would likely have a sugar. Okay? So let's take a look at those categories of molecules. Okay? There's a single myelin with its phosphate. Here's a sphingolipid that's known as a cerebricide, like cerebellum, cerebricide, okay? The, these are found in brain and nerve tissue. Sphingolipids are very commonly found in brain and nerve tissue, okay? You can see that a cerebricide differs from the sphingomyelin that, first of all, it has no phosphate, and in the second place, it has a single sugar on that polar end. Yes, sphingolipids are amphiphilic, just like glycerol phospholipids are amphiphilic. And what makes them amphiphilic in this case is that sugar molecule at the end. It likes water. More complicated uh, sphingolipids include the gangliosides. And gangliosides can be humongously complicated. Look at this guy here. Look at the number of sugars sticking off of this thing. Okay? So gangliosides are sphingolipids that contain multiple sugars. Cerebricides are sphingolipids that contain a single sugar. And the other category over here is sphingomyelin that contains a phosphate. Okay. Uh, I don't need to say anything more there, I don't think. I think we're covered with that. 
Now, I've got just a couple of minutes. I'm going to start, uh, introduce the topic of eicosanoids, and then I'll do our song for the day. Uh, the eicosanoids are molecules that are derived from fatty acids. And their name, again, tells you something about their structure. Icosa means 20. So icosanoids are molecules that contain 20 carbons. And the parental molecule for the icosanoids is arachidonic acid, which also contains 20 carbons. Okay? Icosanoids contain 20 carbons, and they're the parental molecules. I'm sorry, the parental molecule is uh, the arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is shown here at the bottom. And instead of drawing it out as one long straight chain, I've drawn it in this way so that you can see how compact that molecule actually could be, <coughs> excuse me, actually could be made. The reason I show it this way is when we go to, when the cell goes to synthesize a class of molecules known as the prostaglandins, it makes what's called a cyclooxygen bond right here at this position. And the enzyme that catalyzes that is known as a cyclooxygenase. All right. So let's take a look at that real quickly. Cyclooxygenase, first of all, we close the bond and we put oxygens somewhere on there. You might say, well, hey, how about these guys down here? This is not a prostanoid or a prostaglandin. These, on the other hand, are all prostaglandin or prostaglandin-related compounds. And I'll say a little bit more about those next time. Okay, questions about that? You ready for a song? Let's have a song. I don't have a good song about the prostaglandins or about glycerophospholipids, so you'll have to bear with me here. Weather's downy because the rain is mostly cloudy. You can't stop if you complain. Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. It doesn't show signs of slowing, and it's rarely ripe for snowing. Though it's driving some folks insane. Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. When it finally turns out dry, we'll be putting away our rain gear. It'll probably be July. I surely miss the rain gear. The sound of the falling rain, pitter pattering down the rain. That's music inside my brain. Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. All right, guys. See you on Friday.